My name is Daniel Yang. I'm a designer, engineer, frame builder, and I'm from Northern California, or I'm based in Northern California now, from Southern California. Started frame building in 2021, and I've been doing it full time for the last 1.2 years. Uh, video can't be loaded, but that's a robot that I design. Uh, that's kind of my background is robotics and control, and I worked in 3D printing, engineering, software, um, techie stuff. So to give you a little bit of context about my di design style, I'm like, <clears throat> and I like to design bikes that are like an S-Works, high performance, high tech, and then you combine that with Grant Peterson, traditional utilitarian metal, and that's me. So first I wanna thank uh, the reason why I'm here, Philly Bike Expo, Industry 9, and SRAM Inclusivity Scholarship. Uh, I'm here for a couple reasons, or I wanna first celebrate Asian contribution to cycling. I feel like majority of the bike Majority of the bikes are made by Asians, and it'd be cool to see more recognition of that, as well as more uh, Asian people riding bikes. Another part of the mission is size inclusivity and accessibility. Uh, here's you know, celebrating Asians in cycling. I recently came back from a trip uh, from Taiwan, and so you'll see some photos of that later. And uh, I also want to highlight the need for size inclusivity. Um, I think the current sizing model is wrong. You can see this is a chart of the data that I pulled from, uh, I think, NIH. And it shows the distribution of uh, heights for different genders and ethnicities. And you can see the 56 centimeter. I'm sure most of you guys ride a 56 because that's kind of the average size. But with your, if you're 5'10", five, eight, six feet, you have a pretty good selection of sizes. However, when you start going to the smaller sizes, you see most women get binned into a single size. And then in the case of Asian or uh, Latinas, they actually don't have full size representation. And that's not to mention that the smaller and bigger bikes are really poorly designed and they also simply don't exist. Like you can't test ride them. Uh, Here's an example of some stuff I do. Here's a really small all-road bike. And this is the size spectrum that I created. There's 16 different sizes, which sounds crazy, but I think this actually properly represents the full diversity of heights and uh, ethnicities. Here's a really small mountain bike, 5.3 rider. Here's a really big mountain bike for 6.6 rider. They both look pretty good. And I'm also here at Philly to show off Artifact. It's a project that I'm working on, a uh, solo project. This is my bike, the Eterna. Go check it out in the i9 booth. Here is the wheels by i9. Go buy their stuff. Here's a beautiful SRAM red uh, derailleur. You can't buy that, so go complain to them. They stopped making that. And I'm also known for Newhouse Metalworks. This is me and my buddy Nick. Nick is more of the fabricator. We both work on design together. I'm more of the engineer. Uh, and I fabricate some stuff sometimes, once a week. Just going through. Fancy photos, fancy bikes. I'm kind of known for my 3D printing designs. Nick recently finished the 300th frame. Um, we do between 80 to 100 frames per year. I'm gonna sit down, because this is tiring. <laughs> All right, so here gets to the meat of why we're here. We're at a crossroads. And first I should say, disclaimer, opinions ahead. There's many ways to enjoy cycling, right? Uh, Diversity is frame builder's strength, so these are all my opinions, and it's okay if you guys don't agree or think I'm wrong. Uh, and views expressed are my opinions. I should also add that I don't know what I'm doing, so, you know, whether you trust me or not, it's up to you. So, <clears throat> I think Big Bike is a fire sale. After going to Taiwan and seeing the bike industry sausage, 
realize it's an echo chamber of ideas. And everyone's fighting for the same market share. Innovation is just feature creep. So here's a fun experiment we could do. Everyone, you could take out your phone, right? So let's see. So everyone start with your hands raised. Everyone, come on. All right, so look at your, your phone. How many of you guys have one camera? Put, so put your hand down when you don't have one camera, right? So everyone has one camera, right? OK, now how many people have two cameras? Make sure you have a front facing one and back facing one. See? Back up, right? Yeah, smartphone? Yeah. OK, how many has three cameras? Yeah, on smartphone. Ooh, see? Ballers. What about four? Oh, look at that. Some people are loaded here. <laughs> Five. OK. Cool. <laughs> you have an S-Works, too? What? You have an S-Works as well no. with your phone? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So that's called feature creep, right? How many f cameras do you need to actually enjoy photography? You need like one, right? And I think also, if you think about the camera phones have made taking photos so easy that they're more, they're less meaningful, right? I think that's why people shoot film or before you took a photo, it meant something. You would look at it afterwards, you review it, but now we have a whole bunch of garbage on our phones that we don't look at, right? <clears throat> so I think similar to bike industry, a lot of the innovations are just feature creep. Do we really need it? Does it actually help us enjoy cycling, right? Uh, and I think on top of that, I think the media landscape is broken. So it's much harder for new ideas to shine. Think about the consolidation of a lot of the media companies. Who's at Philly Bike Expo? Or which media companies are at Philly Bike Expo, right? Who's going to show off all the great stuff that everyone's doing here? It's, it's, a, it's a problem, I think. So uh, this has been the case throughout all of bike history. I think the small brands are the ones that lead innovation. So think about mountain bikes, wide rims, 29-inch wheels, fat bikes, plus bikes, gravel bikes. They're all made by frame builders, small companies. Take a look at uh, you know, the Bruce Gordon Rock and Road. This is the very first 29er gravel bike. Right? It took a lot of risk and investment to try to push a new tire size for him. And this was like 1988. Right? And only now we're talking about gravel bikes and 29ers. This is a funny quote from uh, John Watson from The Radivist. <laughs> Seagulls fighting over a bag of chips, right? And so I feel like that's kind of the bike industry, is everyone's trying to compete against each other, trying to capture existing market share, and very few people are coming up with newer ideas and bringing more people into cycling. So that leads to the metallic renaissance. And that's uh, the purpose of this talk today. The future is metal. So I think the first point I want to make is I think metal is innovation. So there's a reason why the first 29er was made by steel, right? First gravel bikes were made of steel. Fat bikes made of steel. It's because it's really easy to experiment and prototype and iterate with steel. Carbon tooling is really expensive. Four sizes costs. 35K for the tooling. Think about the design of each bike. Think about the paint, everything, right? So you're fully invested in a design, so you don't want to take any risks. Whereas with steel and metal, you can experiment for free. I also think metal is timeless. So history has proven that the metal bikes are the ones people keep and are desirable. And that's for multiple reasons, right? Like, People claim that, oh, you can repair a metal bike. Honestly, I feel like it's easier to repair a carbon fiber bike. But the reason is, I think carbon bikes, people get a little too fancy with the designs or do too many proprietary stuff that their bikes just don't really end up lasting or they're just not desirable after a while, right? Which bike would you rather have? This beautiful Retrotech that's 10 years old or this 10 year old full suspension? I apologize if this is your bike, your full suspension. I'm not trying to, you know. Um, but yeah, this is an example of big bike innovation, <laughs> right? It's a $12,500 bike that has non-serviceable suspension, which when I read that, it really bothered me because 
It's a moving part. It's got to be replaced, right? Has a proprietary stem. In five years, how much do you think this bike is going to be worth and how's it going to ride, right? The good news is it's already out of date. Look at those cables. They're external. <laughs> also, look at that derailleur hanger. That's not UDH. So this bike's already worthless. That was a joke. All right, and I think the last point is metal is accessible. Um, obviously, I have to build fancy, bougie bikes to show off what I'm capable of, but I really wish that this bike were steel and less than $2,000 and just helps people get into the sport. I think accessibility is inclusivity, and it will get more people riding bikes. The other point I want to bring up is I think history repeats. If you think about the 1970s, mountain bikes started, Bike manufacturing moves from Europe to Japan. 1980s, Specialized allegedly copies the Ricci mountain bike and mass produces it as a stump jumper in Japan. At that time, bike manufacturing starts moving from D Japan to Taiwan. These are all steel bikes. Then in the 90s, you get aluminum starts gaining traction, production moves to China, and then carbon bikes become more popular. They're produced in uh, or sorry, in the 2000s, carbon bikes become more popular. They're produced in Taiwan and China. I think the steel bikes have a little uh, resurgence thanks to the 29er. And then now, uh, or now you have gravel bikes, disc brake, road bikes, integrated cables, electronic drivetrains. And in the, the now now uh, is the COVID bust, right? No one stuck around thanks to the bike industry, right? Like, None of the new people who bought bikes continue doing it. And brands are going out of business. Bike fits are worse than ever. And electronics are being forced on everybody. So what is it time for? The metallic renaissance. Yes, thank you. Talk is done. No, I'm kidding. There's like 100 more slides. Yeah, so I think there's room for the simple, reliable metal bicycle. So now, just a quick detour on stuff that I do that, I guess, first we'll talk about New House, where I did most of the design and engineering, and then we'll also talk about, uh, I'll show you some exclusive content from our, uh, the Taiwan trip that I just completed. So. My process is very digital. Uh, so I design all the bikes in 3D. And because of that, I can achieve exact clearances, precision. There's no limitations. I can do whatever dropouts I want, head tubes I want. Um, and after you've kind of perfected this workflow, it's a lot faster. Uh, let's see. Demo, live demos always are a disaster, but I'll try to do one. So I think like people know me for my 3D printing, but it's really just the 3D CAD that's the strength. The, the 3D printing is just uh, the fancy stuff. So let's see. At the risk of blowing up this presentation, let me see if I can. The other sad thing is everything is cloud-based, and there's no internet here. So it's risky. All right, so this is a, a road bike, right? And I've worked on this. 3D CAD process, uh, okay, it's not happy. Oh, there we go. Um, wow. Okay, I've worked on this CAD process a lot so that the design is very optimized and it, it can adjust without breaking. So let's take this 58 and let me show you if I try to make it into a smaller bike. Uh, edit, you know what? I think this is not demo's not going to happen. You got to display the sketch folder for that thing. Oh, someone's, someone's a Fusion Pro here. Thank you. Appreciate that. No. Nope. I don't think this is going to work. All right. Let me just show you. Pretend. Some tricks that I do is I. Uh, Design in all the clearance bodies. So this is a tire with exactly three moils of clearance. And then I'm able to parameter, 
parametrically link this bend location and angle to the exact location of the tire. So the idea behind this demo, you can imagine, is that, wow, Fusion is not happy being offline. Mm -hmm. All right. The example here is that I can just update a couple parameters and tube diameters, and this bike can shrink down to a 44 centimeter with exact bends already pre-calculated. And then the 2G, 2D drawings, which is actually how I construct the bike, are automatically updated. So every single dimension is pulled and transferred over. So obviously, it's a big investment to design a bike in 3D. But once you've designed one model, you could extrapolate that to infinite sizes. Obviously, stuff breaks sometimes, but you can fix it. So great demo, right? Thank Fusion and thank the, the uh, expo for not having internet. Or sorry, the venue for not having internet. That's why the demo was a question mark. All right, let's keep rolling. So another big part about what I do at Newhouse is size inclusivity. So I use a model-based sizing scheme. Um, and with that, I developed full spectrum sizing. You could see the small sizes have really low stack. And the stack actually increases very quickly. So you see that when you get up to the extra, extra large, or even the XL, maybe someone who's 6'1", the handlebars are already a lot higher than mainstream bike brands. right? And another thing to note is that the steps are really small. So it's very easy to find the right size. right? So if you're like long legs, short torso, long torso, short legs, or if you're short torso and short legs, you're just short, um, you can find a size. The other thing we do is we really try to balance out the weight distribution. So using physics to kind of determine what the chainstay length and front center needs to be of this, the bikes. It's ideally you keep it constant, but the reality is, is people at different sizes are used to different riding characteristics and they, uh, they're just some physical limitations on how you could design a bike. And uh, another big, I'm going to be the, the two bottle uh, mogul, two bottles for every bike. That's like my main goal. Here is a extra small hummingbird for a 5.5 five rider. And uh, I'm also known for additive manufacturing. There's three reasons why you should 3D print something. It, if it's a thin, lightweight structure, or it's an impossible geometry, or if it is customizable. So in this case, I only use 3D printing if it's a cost-saving or time-saving measure. I don't like to do it just for the sake of doing it. Uh, just a little bit for the nerds out there. Uh, this really accurate Microsoft Paint graph. Uh, additive manufacturing has the benefit of initial cost is low, but then it kind of hits a flat line because there's still a lot of labor and it's time intensive to produce the parts. Whereas traditional manufacturing, the initial cost is high because you have to pay for tooling. But as you get to quantities of like 500 or 1,000, that it you start approaching the cost of the material. This is a 3D printed yoke that we use on our roller bikes, stainless. Uh, this is my signature design, the Y yoke. Last name's Y, kind of looks like a Y. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it, here's it on the Eterna. More fancy photos, 3D printed dropout. Uh, this is a, one of my signature innovations, the bottle bracket. So it is one of the reasons why I can put two bottles on every size. If you're familiar with mountain bikes, the dropper post will come in, and it will usually hit the first water bottle screw, and that prevents a deep insertion of the dropper post. This bracket angles, angles the boss outside of the tube, so the screw doesn't penetrate the tube. And so you could get uh, probably an extra 60 millimeters of insertion. And for small bikes, that's make or break between running a dropper or not, or a bottle. Here it is on a bike. Uh, also do some fancy 3D printed ports. This is a cool weather sealed port that's almost like a drywall plug. It expands out. Um, the urethane's also 3D printed as well. And it, uh, yeah, it locks into the port. Here's on a bike. Here's a 3D printed uh, cable port for 
mechanical shifting. And yeah, to summarize the story of Newhouse Metalworks, uh, digital design is precise and powerful. I like to use a quantitative approach to design decisions and really focus on inclusive sizing, making sure everyone gets a nice handling, nice fitting bike. And we use 3D printing to create the future now. All right, part two, Tai Chung. Uh, this is exclusive content, so pay-per-view only. So if you can zoom into my face, crop out the slides. No, I'm serious, but don't zoom in too tight. Uh, okay, seriously, you want me to not have to... Well, yeah, I'm yeah, so pay-per-view only for people who came to Philly. Let's give you guys a hand. <laughs> yeah, can you crop out the slide? Yeah. All right. Yeah, all right. Has it just been me the entire time? No, I've been going back and forth. Okay, That's, I was joking about cropping in super tight, but you crop that out. But you, don't, you definitely don't want to buy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I'll tell you when we, we go back in. So, uh, yeah. I went with uh, another builder, Adam Sklar, to Tai Chung. Part of it was to, he has business there, uh, so we were able to visit a lot of the factories, and I've been trying to, one, it's been a dream of mine to learn from, how, learn from their manufacturing, but two, I wanted to write a story and help showcase Asian manufacturing. So just a little world building here. Um, Taipei is the major city in Taiwan. And Taichung is about, I'd say, an hour south. And there's like a little pocket here where there's a, a metal frame building, paint, casting, warehousing, all in that area. Here's some more world building. Night market, the squid was really good. Uh, Cat was really cool. <laughs> uh, another funny thing is all the factories are in random taro and rice patties. Apparently there's some weird zoning, zoning <laughs> laws that, or lack of zoning laws that allow that. All right, so one of our first stops was, was Aura Engineering. And Aura is a high-end steel and titanium manufacturer. They build over 15,000 frames per year. I was truly impressed by uh, their, what they're able to do, their mindset, their capabilities. So just kind of go through these quickly here. Wire EDM. Um, for those that don't know, most frame builders, they miter tubes using a hole saw. So a spinning saw punches through the tube, miters it. But they actually do this digitally with wire EDM. So a little, a little cable has electricity running through. And when it touches the tube, it eats up all the metal as it goes around. Pretty cool, I've never seen that before. Um, look at those miters, super precise. They were like, they made me feel uncomfortable how precise they were with their miters because it made me realize how imprecise my miters were. Uh, they have an array of CNC machines where they machine all their dropouts. Here's, I think, uh, messing around with some ports. Here's Adam. This is, uh, he's a proud owner of this top tube mold. It's pretty cool. Everything they do is kind of a punch mold. And uh, it's his signature curved oblized top tube form for his new tall tail mountain bike. Pre-order now, go to the website. This is a really cool machine. So they, uh, they actually put a bare bottom bracket shell into the frame and weld it. And then afterwards, they have, they load the whole bike into the machine, and the machine will machine the bottom bracket threads and relieve it and face the sides. So it's super accurate. How we do it is we have the bottom bracket shell already faced, or sorry, it already has threads in it, and we put it in and weld it, but when you weld it, it distorts the bottom bracket. And then we have to go and manually finish it afterwards, but it's never the same. Uh, here, they're able to get much more precision with this machine. Here's some people working. Uh, this is what truly impressed me, is this machine. Does anyone know what this is? Taking guesses. You're an expert, that's not fair. <laughs> Leave some for the, the, the 
the average people out there. Yes, a tube budding machine. So Aura does all of their tube budding in house, which is crazy. And for tube budding, I expected you know a really loud, obnoxious machine, and that's why we don't see that many. But this machine is actually pretty friendly. It like push a little tube out, and it poops it out, and it falls down, and someone takes it, puts it on the rack. Um, the reason why they bring this in-house is that they can do custom tube specs and budding profiles uh, and do things that other companies aren't willing to do. So here's the machine. These are all the different mandrels for all the different tube sizes. And uh, for those builder nerds out there, actually, I, it's in my other slide. I'll, I'll get to it. Um, here is their, I think this is their alignment table. They had a really cool digital verification table where they just put their, uh, yeah, they put their bike on the table. They get all the axle head tube locations, and it spits out a digital reading of the accuracy of the frame. Here's the welding stations. Uh, here's one of their bikes. It's really cool design. All right, so lessons from Aura. Uh, I was really, really impressed. Uh, I f after seeing their capability, I think they have the ability to make the best metal bikes in the world. They have in-house testing, budding in-house, which I don't think anyone else has, uh, and the knowledge and craftsmanship to really make good bikes. And uh, yeah, for example, the tube budding, they're able to make a, oh, that's a typo, a one, oh no, that's not a typo, a one to 0.7 to 1.4 budded tube. So that's a down tube, and that allows you to pass testing without having a gusset. So it's for mountain bike. It, yeah, that kind of tube doesn't exist as far as my knowledge. And they said that normally a tube is budded three or four times, but they have to butt this tube six times to achieve that uh, thickness of the head tube. Oh, they also have heat treatment in-house, too. Um, that's pretty cool. Heat treatment for what? For us, for chromoly? For yeah, chromoly, uh, titanium, everything stainless. Uh, yeah, heat treatment, right? What's that? I don't know. But aluminum, do they do aluminum? They do aluminum frames. Uh, I didn't really ask much about that because who cares? It's aluminum. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, alu okay, so I should say aluminum, I think it actually requires, it's not the same as steel and titanium because you, you have to in invest in a lot more. Well, people just expect an aluminum bike to have all the forming and shapes to it, like a carbon fiber bike. So you have to invest a lot more in the, the tooling to make it lightweight and high performance. Uh, and also, you have to heat treat it afterwards. And so you need, it's a lot more expensive to do it at a smaller scale. They were manufacturing aluminum bikes for a big mountain bike company. Uh, and the other conclusion is, I think the investment in technology really pays off. I think that's something that, uh, I guess, American frame building scene can learn from. Daniel, did you talk to them about 3D printing at all? Yeah, they're, they, they're thinking about it. So there's a couple really big uh, Chinese titanium manufacturers who fully embrace 3D printing, which is also very cool to see. Uh, I'm with Aura. I'm a little skeptical about its use in mass manufacture. I think a lot of people are 3D printing because it's novel. Uh, oh, sorry, that's my opinion. To, to answer your question, uh, they're working on it. They've done testing with it, and they're seeing where it matters and where it doesn't, and whether it's worth bringing that in-house or not. Cool. Also, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me anytime. Anyway, and on that note, any questions about Aura? Thoughts? All right, next one. How many, I know you probably wouldn't be allowed to say this, but how many large manufacturers, Norco, Santa Cruz, whatever, specialized, get their bikes made from Aura? Yeah, okay, so that's actually a good question. 
So one, I don't know. But two, put a little context of this visit. We're actually just visiting big bike, small bike. So like this is a niche. The, the titanium steel bike is a niche industry among big, big bike. Uh, like I would say probably 3% of bikes are high-end steel and titanium bikes. So there's factories dedicated to just aluminum, carbon fiber, full suspension bikes. And they're not necessarily in Taiwan. They could be in all over the world. So like this would be like where you'd see like a Soma stainless steel getting built and then the shitty narco is built down the street. Uh, shitty narco is not built in Taiwan. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Soma is too low end for the shop. That's, yeah. I'll get to the, the Soma shop. Well, actually, I don't know where the Soma shop is, but yeah, what's up? What was the average age of uh, like the factory workers there? Uh, was it like, were there any younger guys? Or was most yeah, I would say most of them are young. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure, but it was like older guys who have worked in this who have most of the experience, and the youth has no interest in it there at all. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because, uh, and, and like, I don't want to get too much into politics or, or like whatever, um, but a lot of the workers like doing the hard, hard labor were migrant workers from Southeast Asia. Uh, and yeah, so, so they're younger and they're there to, to do like the welding and the machining. I think it seemed like some of the older OG uh, workers have kind of gravitated towards uh, managing the production. Uh, but that's kind of the, the breakdown of it. Yeah, definitely. I think um, obviously people always have questions about Asian manufacturing and, you know, it's, it's like what's going on and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was impressed. Like, obviously people weren't wearing PPE and I asked them, or personal protective equipment and I asked them about that. But also they have universal health care. So, you know, like, <laughs> get something in your eye, it's pretty easy to take care of, right? Um, yeah, and cost of living is good and uh, or low, and also the minimum wage is relative to that. So, um, yeah, cool. On to everyone's favorite, Maxway. Who knows about Maxway? Yeah, it has like a legendary, mysterious appeal. Um, Maxway is a much more traditional factory, and I think it's also important to note that this is still considered the highest end steel factory. Um, again, it's like a niche of a niche, right? And I think they're famous for making Surly and All City bikes, and now they make a lot more uh, smaller boutique brands. Uh, they've been building bikes for 38 years, and it's interesting talking to the owner. It's kind of like they've experienced the mass, mass steel manufacturer of like BMX bikes and then the Surly All City, and then everything phasing out to aluminum, moving to China, and then now they're doing more boutique stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to get that perspective. Here's a double drill. I tried to import this, not possible. Um, everything is kind of stamped, so all their, we, frame builders here typically bend every tube, but everything they do is a stamp mold. Uh, I asked, one of these molds costs about $1,000, to give you an idea. So it's, uh, to, you have to hit a certain scale to make it worth it. This is a chainstay machine, chainstay mitering machine. Very similar to what we use, too. Um, super long chainstays. Wonder who, whose bike has 460 millimeter chainstays made of steel. Hmm, I wonder. Uh, welding setup. This is a alignment table. Stacks on stacks of frames. So uh, yeah, some lessons from Maxway. There's kind of the debate about lean manufacturing and batch production, and they're definitely more batch production. It takes about a 1.5 hour tool change per size. And how they do it is very interesting. They, they basically have a production manager and a one-to-one -one drawing. And at the beginning of the day, they'll like set up the, the, the stamping machine, 
stamp it, make sure all the stops are in the correct place, and then like put it on the one-to-one -one drawing, and it's good to go, and then they, they punch through all the bikes. Um, it's one process, one machine, one person. So that's how it's super efficient. They do the front triangles separate from the rear triangles, then they combine them together. And what's interesting is they also outsourced, or not outsourced, by outsourced, they apparently it's the owner, Yi Yi's cousin, who miters the tubes. So they do the tube mitering uh, somewhere else. And another theme was that you have to evolve to survive. So 38 years in business, they've seen the entire landscape of metal bikes. Um, it went from mass manufacturer to boutique steel. And so now they have to, designs are more complicated. There's more sizes. There's more weird, fancy things on the bikes. Um, yeah, and then I think there are no secrets to the factory. It's just hard work, as you see in the photos. Yeah? So just to be clear, another factory miters the two ends of the tubes, and then those, those miter tubes arrive at this factory where they bend them, dimple them, and then weld them. Is that it? Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on the bike. I'm pretty sure only the straight ones, straight tubes, get the, the mitering done. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure they could do both. It's just whatever they decide is, is more efficient. Yeah, 40,000 frames per year, pretty crazy. Yeah. Can you describe the process of setup in the morning where mm -hmm. they would prepare their tooling, stamp apart, mm -hmm. and then compare it to a one-to-one -one drawing? Yeah. Are they not using CAD? Did they not embrace that? Yeah, so that's, that's actually, when I see frame building, I guess, they always had one-to-one -on -one drawings, which I was like, yeah, why aren't they doing CAD? But yeah, they actually designed all the bikes in SolidWorks. The one-to-one -one is for the floor for them to like make sure that that bend is correct. It's, it's a very easy check. check. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like a go-no-go -no -go kind of check. But even something is like dimpling the chainstay, uh, they, it, if you dimple it too much, you could, you could kink the tube. And so they have to manually adjust the dimple height that for that batch to make sure that the, the tubes are good. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool to see that. Any other questions on that? Um, I, I kind of actually do. So, yeah. Uh, no secret in the bike world, but surly chain stays crack. Yeah. Quite often. Yeah. Would uh, a company like this be like, yo, surly guys probably shouldn't do that? Yeah. And then surly's like, no, yolo, let's send it. Yeah, I think so. That's one of the. It's a good question. I think that's one of my takeaways from the visit is that. Uh, there's kind of a disconnect, right? Whether it's cultural or communication, and like uh, there's the manufacturer who has their expertise on the tooling and how they can make the bikes, and then the designer who wants like certain clearances and and all these things, and it's not necessarily communicated back and forth. Um, I think in the case of the Surly chain stay, it's dimpled too much, so it's probably asking for too much tire clearance that you can. Uh, asking for too much tire clearance uh, that you can get with a tube. But yeah, I'm not sure who's the ultimate person responsible for that, right? Um, yeah, I think there's definitely room for improvement there. It's also like mistakes happen, you know? Um, it's hard to know what's the limit you can push. I, I would also say all the, the factories do testing on their bikes, which is cool to see. But I'll, you'll see later too, I don't think testing fully captures uh, what goes through. Because I'm sure those bikes passed testing, but they still broke, right? How yeah. much of their, how much of their uh, production is sent across the globe versus serving a local market that would facilitate that feedback that, hey, this ship's cracking, and you, know, you need to yeah. revisit something on your I would say market. none goes to the local market, which to me is a little you know, I want more people to enjoy cycling and everything, so it's kind of sad to see. But I think that's also changing. Like, uh, I think in Taiwan and Asia, cycling is growing, so, or cycling as a sport is growing, I should say. Um, but yeah, I think that's room for improvement in the future. Closing that loop, communicating a little bit better. All right, let's keep rolling. Paint. This was, I think, the really cool thing to see is this giant conveyor belt factory. Um, yeah, paint. I think building bikes. In America, as for those frame builders who know, 
or experience, paint is the killer. It's like the paint costs more than the frame itself, right? And we have to ship the bike. It's not the most sustainable practice. It's annoying. Um, so this is a giant factory that paints on a giant conveyor belt, goes through multiple steps. Is it powder or liquid? Liquid. Um, redacted. Got in trouble for posting this photo. It's also S works. <laughs> yeah. Um, tire factory, redacted. Uh, this is cool. So a tire mold. It's about six thousand US. Uh, pretty cool to see. Giant mold comes down. Then they inflate it. Oh, yeah. Make a tire. And then. Uh, I, I would say this was the funnest visit for me, is the casting factory. Um, I think uh, after visiting the casting factory, I just had, I realized there's so much more potential for building bikes with casting. It's kind of like, uh, it's a traditional technology that hasn't really seen creative input into it. So for, I'll show the process, they use, investment casting or lost wax casting, I think people call it. And you start with a wax replica of your part. You dip it in ceramic, you form a casing, you pour metal in. That's the basics of it, but I'll show you the steps. So here you see some dropouts in a metal mold. Here's a little close-up of it. Uh, these are the wax replicas of the part that you're trying to create. And uh, they add it to this tree, this wax tree, which allows you to pour the metal in. Then they dip this tree into a ceramic slurry in multiple stages to harden a casing around it. There you see, this is the final step. It's a very coarse grain. And then here, this is with the wax melted out. So now you have a mold to cast your part. Very photogenic scene of metal pouring in to the mold. And then afterwards, the mold is basically useless. They crack it open to get the parts out. And uh, from there, it is a lot of manually processing these parts to get the little mold uh, trees off. And they actually align some of the parts to the specifications. It was really cool to see. Here's some random, yeah. Uh, what percentage of cast parts are steel? And do you see that changing in terms of that percentages? You mean in Taiwan manufacturing? I would say all the parts are, like all the dropouts are cast. Um, what about the percentage of steel versus other alloys? Oh. Uh, some companies do cast titanium. I think it's rarer. Uh, steel, yeah, stainless, mild steel. Also, uh, what was really cool to me is I didn't realize you could cast 4130 and then heat treat it afterwards. So that was pretty mind blowing to me when I. Aura was doing that, and I was like, wait, you guys heat treat it? I was like, yeah, we heat treat it. I was like, what? I've never even, like, it blew my mind. I didn't know that was possible. So like I said, I think there's a lot of potential. And earlier in the presentation, I saw there was some CNC machines which you mentioned were for dropouts. Yeah. Right? So yeah. are they cast machined? Yeah, so Aura takes pride in post-machining some of the cast dropouts for steel bikes. Um, whereas, but they also do a lot of titanium bikes which are machined, so. Mm, this one was not bike specific. That's why you see this random souvenir thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, I, yeah, it was just really cool to see. Yeah. They do bike stuff, like you saw the dropout, but it wasn't a bike specific caster. All right, and then final stop is forks. So uh, this is a specific fork handlebar factory. And they have, this is, doing the unicrown fork so they bend it. The cool thing is like when you have complete control over the bend and the tubes, you can make whatever fork you want. And this machine is mitering both sides. They just clamp it in and it punches through, uh, miters the legs. This is what you end up with. Oh, I should also mention too what was cool is uh, because, so when, for frame builders here, we had to buy a bent fork crown. Um, they don't. So what they actually do is they weld the dropout onto the fork leg, and then they bend the unicrown part. So it's, it's like 
perfect alignment, right? Um, very cool to see. Again, like, ugh, I wish I had this machine. Couldn't import it, you know? Weight limit on the, the airlines. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, here's the, you see the dropout's already welded on, right? So that's cool. Uh, here's a double drill. But if you thought the double drill was impressive, check out that triple drill, right? <laughs> I want to take this thing too. Actually, I'm not, a, I'm not a big boss guy, so, you know, but someone can use that. All right, so lessons learned from Taiwan. I think the number one thing, hard work is hard, right? So like it, it gave me a lot more appreciation, you know, even though like it's a $800 steel frame, right? Every single step took a person, it's, it's hard work, right? Like factories are loud, they're noisy. We build frames, it's kind of cool, artsy, but there's a lot of Asian people just doing the hard work, right? Um, Capital equipment, knowledge, and craftsmanship. That's really cool to see how much stuff they're doing there. Uh, they have machines that we don't have access to, knowledge that maybe was lost or never got to America, right? Um, and then the centralized location is really key, having casting, frame building, tube budding, paint, warehousing, all within 10 miles is very efficient, sustainable, and the bikes are a lot cheaper because of that. Uh, some realizations I had is we could do the same. We can make our own tooling, create our own products and standards. And I really think casting is unrealized potential. Yeah, apparently a casting mold is like a thousand to two thousand, or sorry, a thousand to thousand five hundred, um, which is cheap because it's actually an aluminum mold since you're only just casting wax in it. It doesn't have to be a steel mold. So it's cheaper than I thought. Um, I don't know what the minimum order quantity and uh, the unit price for it is, but it has potential. Cool. Any questions on that? Did you go to, did you go to a forging factory? Uh, no. No. Yeah. All right. Part three. Renaissance. Let me see. How much time do I have? I got to wrap up pretty quick, huh? Ten minutes. Let's go. Uh, this is what I think needs to happen for this renaissance, this metallic renaissance. So one, I think we more, need more research, development, and testing. Uh, bikes are so complicated, and expectations are higher than ever. And metal bike innovations are going to be harder to come by. And I think they're only going to be found by closing the loop through testing. Some things, some ideas. I think a size to stiffness model would be really cool to see. Um, I'm very interested in making the same riding characteristic for all different heights and weights. So for the really small size, I, you know, I'm a big guy. I don't really know what it's like to ride a small frame. But uh, I would really like to know how the size and the tube spec and the budding profiles influence the torsional stiffness of a frame. Um, I think we need to understand more about print, 3D printing and casting strength. I think there's room for new materials and heat treatment um, protocols, new budding profiles, metal-specific standards, size-specific standards. So I'll give an example, and this was kind of one of the realizations I had from Taiwan, is fork testing. So uh, this is actually cool. This is the Aura Fork Titanium, and it's blue because it's heat treated, right? That's really cool to see. Oh, wait, you can move the camera back on the thing. Yeah, pay-per-view's over. Um, yeah, so here's an example. So I asked the fork wizard in Taiwan. He like knew, he knew what butts would pass which testing, which was crazy, just because he had so much experience with making uh, steel forks. So I asked him like, okay, you have the steel fork. What mo which test does it usually fail? And he said the static bending test. And the static bending test is you just put a uh, thousand five hundred newtons, which I think is. 300 pounds uh, onto the fork leg, and then that's the test. And what he said is, uh, like, how it usually happens is the fork bends, which fails the test, or a little crack appears. Um, and in my head, I'm like, that's not how people ride bikes, right? Like, I, I actually thought the fatigue test was what would break it, but yeah. That test happens after the other test, though. It's the last one. Yeah. OK. So they might be fatigued prior. Right. Yeah. but. Uh, it's also, if you look at these standards too, you know, 
mountain bikes, like what is mountain biking? Some people do some crazy stuff, some people do some simple stuff, right? Um, like, and then I asked him, so what failure do you actually see in your forks? And he said, it's the brake mount failure. Um, and so the thing is like, there is a test for that, but clearly that test is not capturing what happens in real riding, right? Um, it's also, when I look at this test, it's kind of interesting because why does the road bike have more fatigue cycles than the mountain bike? Like I brake way more on a mountain bike than I do a road bike, right? So I don't know who created these standards, right? Obviously testing standards is important. Um, it's not like I'm saying throw those out the window, but I think steel bikes have different failure modes. People ride them differently. There's room to kind of understand and um, push these tests further. The other thing I think we need to do is create our own metal bike standards. So bike industry is going carbon and e-bikes and electronic. And because of that, all the new standards like internal cable routing, UDH, they're all designed for that purpose. And by trying to make a metal bike into a carbon fiber bike, we're making worse bikes. They're more expensive, they're heavier, and they don't really add to the ride, right? Go back to the phone camera example that I started with, doesn't it make you enjoy your ride, you know? Um, ideas, you know, EC37 head tube, that's the project I'm working on, for sale at some point. I have 100 of these now, need to get rid of them. Um, but that's how invested I am in, in new technologies or new standards. Uh, a fork ecosystem would be great. Uh, let's see, flat mount standards. This is a great example of Paragon uh, using the front flat mount on the rear of the bike, just because flat mount, uh, it's, it's really problematic on a metal bike just because the location ends up eating a lot of our tube, uh, our chainstay. So, you know, a new standard, right, a, to suit a metal bike. Another example, I hate UDH. Um, it's, it, it's not designed for metal bikes. And so I think we should have an open source metal derailleur hanger, something that fits metal bikes and works really well. With it. This is an, an example of a Ricci hanger, which I think is extremely well designed. Um, and then another great example, this is being pushed by Rob English. It's a rim brake standard for gravel bikes. Direct mount 68, uh, clears a 44 mil tire. And I would love to see the same thing for road bikes as well to clear a 32 millimeter tire. I was really pushing for that and doing a lot of research and design for that. Then I realized none of the major Drive chain manufacturers are supporting rim brake, mechanical rim brake stuff. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. Are you on the list to get a set of those? No. Uh, again, like, I have other fish that I need to fry right now. Um, but, cheap, yeah. Yeah. I mean, great for like a Halo product, but I would love to see that technology trickle down because I think entry level rim brakes are going to be a lot better than uh, disc brakes. Yeah, they did. Yeah, so, I mean, I get it, right? Like, if SRAM and Shimano stop making mechanical drivetrains, then having a brake is kind of, you know, it, it's, it becomes just a niche product, and I want to see it more mainstream. Uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to work together, right? Standards are only standards if we agree on them. Um, there's also economies of scale, right? One, 10, I think 100, the metallic magic, begins, and when you get to 1,000, that's the metallic renaissance. That's when you can do casting, that's when you can do testing, that's when you can create better products, lower price. Uh, this is AI generated, <laughs> and I realize the AI both does not know how to build a frame and is racist, because everyone here is white. <laughs> All right, and the last point, I think everyone, it'd be good to think bigger, right? Like, let's be better than big bike. Uh, how do we build a, a better metal bicycle? What does success look like in 2024, right? Economy, uh, media, everything's always shifting. And so what does, like, how do we do frame building sustainably? And who will be the next Ricci or the next Specialized, right? We've got to try to repeat history, recreate that uh, era in the 80s and 90s. And then I'll leave it at this. this so I run an online forum and uh, for custom frame building, 
and someone had posted this a little while back, and it really made me think. It's the fulfillment curve. So on the bottom is money or time or energy spent, and then on the left is fulfillment or satisfaction. And I realized this, you know, I, I feel like everyone experiences this, right? Like you go from survival, you're making gains, and it's comfortable, you're feeling good, you start creeping into luxury, and then all of a sudden, like, you're not happy. Think about how many rich people just have all these problems, right? Um, I think that's because they reached that point of enough, and everyone's curve looks different, everyone has different expectations in life. But I really feel like Big Bike is at enough, and it's going over the edge, and it's pulling everyone with it. And I think the metallic renaissance is really that little sweet spot between comfort and luxury, where you have a great performing, reliable bike, you love it, you enjoy it, and it doesn't cost $8,000, and you can maintain it yourself. So anyway, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Questions, or if we get kicked out, I'm in the I-9 booth, so feel free to stop by. There's a picnic table. We can chat. Yeah? Uh, I only know the American market, so I can only speak to that. But uh, I mean, I think it's something that would be good for everybody if bikes are just cheaper and more accessible. There, there's some brands that have steel bikes that are affordable, kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say even those are still niche compared to that. That was one of my takeaways from Taiwan is just how many bikes there are, right? Like, and even you see the factories producing maybe, let's call it 100,000 niche steel titanium bikes, that's still a drop in the bucket compared to like, you know, the millions of bikes produced every year, so. Anyone else? Where are the US? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why don't you Yeah, I don't know. Well, what's up? I would, okay, sorry, let me answer your question first, and I'll talk about aluminum. Yeah, uh, where would be, I don't know, it's wherever. I think the world is, in a way, smaller because of technology, so I think it can happen anywhere, right? I think it's really cool to see the East Coast scene has their own vibe, and I think that's the benefit of smaller brands, too, is you can really cater to the community around you, right? Like, Specialized doesn't really know what's going on in Philly, you know? and like. You could have local builders building bikes for how people like to ride, and uh, you know the other way around too. East Coast or West Coast can do their own thing. Oh wait, sorry, we got a we got a feisty question over here about aluminum. Uh, I would say I'm talking about more of the mainstream aluminum bikes. Your bikes are great; they're simple, reliable. They're uh, very much similar construction to steel and titanium. So I would say, yes, don't worry. Should I put an asterisk? I'll change everything. <laughs> Rewind. Um, yeah, I'm talking more about the hydroformed, like hydroformed aluminum or carbon cop like carbon copy, copies of carbon bikes that people are trying to like trickle down. That's, those are travesties. Like they're so stiff. They have all the shaping for no reason. Um, so yes, are you, are you cool? You're good, we're, we're friends? Okay, all right. I didn't know we were friends actually, so it's great. Um, question around here, yeah. How do you envision like bike shops factoring all that Oh yeah, uh, so that's another big issue too, is like, you know, all city kind of going out of business. Um, I think it's related to the independent bike shop going out of business as well. Like I think QBP is gonna struggle because they rely on independent bikes, and Big Bike is buying up all the you know, smaller bike shops, converting them to factory shops. And I think, I mean, in one way, I think it's both good and bad. Like, I think bigger companies can provide more security for workers, or, or I don't know. I don't really care about Big Bike. But I would say for bike shops, the benefit is that uh, you can, it's really the source of community. So like group rides or you know, even building trails or posting routes, that 
combined with a bike that's kind of customized or designed for that area, I think would really help the independent bikes. Um, also, like the smaller brands, I think will if the more desirable they become, the more it's going to help the independent bike shop because it should be more accessible to get those bikes rather than you know a S Works tarmac or something. Yeah, I don't know. I, that goes to the whole. I think media landscape is in problem, like big problem, because media companies they're all getting bought out by bigger entities, and there's so much just trash on the internet now. Everything's AI generated. Everything's an affiliate link. Everything's a top 10, 10 products of 2024, right? Um, so I, I feel like maybe all that noise is just gonna blow up the whole internet anyway, and then people are gonna return back to local communities. That's my guess. I don't know. Not my expertise. I'm just an engineer. Yeah. Um, but that's what I hope. Uh, and I hope that the, the bikes will help, the metal bikes can help build that community. Because um, you see like group rides, a lot of people riding metal bikes. It's already happening, right? Yeah. So other than like your own stuff and you how metal works, mm -hmm. if we're talking about like frame builders and like this innovation, what's your favorite company and who do you look up to? Mm. I like, yeah, I like, I like Richie. It's so funny because some conversations with like the owner of Tange, Richie's name pops up randomly, right? Like, oh yeah, he taught me this and you know, that's really cool. Uh, I also like Rivendell bikes. I don't necessarily agree with their design philosophy, but I like how they stuck to something that they really believe in and they just do it really well. And their bikes are affordable and practical. Yeah. Cool, all right. Let's clear out the room. Thank you. Thank you.